Welcome to the Business of Apparel podcast. This is the place to learn how to start and scale your own apparel brand and fill it with loyal customers for years to come. I'm your host, Rachel Erickson, owner and CEO of Unmarked Street. I can't wait to share this episode with you. Welcome, welcome. In today's episode of the Business of Apparel podcast, I get the opportunity to interview one of my very best friends, um, someone who I have been working with and just gotten to know over the last decade of my career and life. And Mr. Ben Girding is just such a good human and really thinking about the apparel industry in a new way. Um, he just started his own company, Rotopo Dev, recently. And so we're going to talk a little bit about 3D renderings and how that can help with your development. Uh, we'll get into some fabric discussions. And then ultimately, we'll also talk about his dream for his own apparel line someday. I hope you enjoy. Like, let's say that a, a big name company, a corporation who's using one of these 3D softwares has found the best way to use it for them. Like they've found a really great process and everything share that you know if, yeah imagine if the first mill that made recycled polyester decided to patent it and said no one else can make recycled polyester yarns anymore and i don't yeah. know that i'm not a lawyer or whatever so i don't even know if that's possible but let's just say it is <laughs> like you're not doing a service to what we're trying to solve here we're trying to solve this issue that we've created and yeah. sharing that knowledge out of how to use it better is just gonna make everyone better to like fix some of these or help minimize some of these issues that we're, we've created. Yeah, well, and I think to that point too, like sharing the information and getting more of it out there will help to drive the cost down on some of these things that, you know, for example, getting recycled polyester, it costs what, an extra dollar a yard um, when you're buying, you know, thousands and thousands of yards that adds up. And so some brands choose to, to not go with the recycled polyester because that extra dollar a yard, they can't afford it. It's going to break their margins. It's going to break the bank. Um, and I think having more options of that, or even having it be almost a mandatory thing for certain brands to have to use, especially if they want to mark anything sustainable or green is, is one way of driving that cost down, which then in turn, I think starts to put us in a, a scenario where we can battle fast fashion. I think that's one of the hardest parts that I've even been hearing as I've been talking to more people is, you know, fast fashion provides a solution to people who can't necessarily buy clothes in other places, right? Like there's a way for you to go get something that's on trend or maybe something that looks professional at a really good price because you need it for an interview or you need it for a party or you, whatever, whatever has come up for you. And, and that kind of mentality, I think, has it, it needs to shift. And I think the rest of the apparel industry, and including mills and trim suppliers and, and all of them, need to start considering how we can bring our costs down while still providing value. Yeah, I think there's, I, a while ago, I did a, a circular product workshop, basically, and it was super interesting. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, always learning new things about sustainability and um, you know I won't say that I'm like the best ever because there's people who spend their whole lives doing it like that have been researching yeah. it more than I have and um, during that workshop is super interesting basically looking at like the business models and how for example with like fast fashion you know instead of building in a single product that might be really cheap that's sort of made to be thrown away building mm -hmm. something that's actually really durable, long lasting and do like a subscription model with it or something where you actually like buy it, you wear it, return it, they wash it really nicely and like it keeps going. And like there's that's a, a lot idea. of different ways to build your product line around like this circular concept or like, you know, environmental like sustainability, uh, durability being another one when you look at yeah. like the old old refrigerators and stuff from like back in the day that have the they're cool still record. hanging out they're yeah. still going you know because yeah the, the model back then was build it bomb proof and and let it live you know yeah so like going back to that is is what we need to start doing 
Seriously. Well, and, and when I think about like vintage clothing, you know, like thrifting and, and buying vintage has become such a big thing, but it's only a thing because those clothes have lasted as long as they have, they were made better. They were sewn better. Like they, the fabrics were a little bit more durable and people thought about how to make apparel in that way at that time. And I, I, I think that's one of the biggest things that I definitely strive for when I'm working with brands or even when I'm working on my own apparel stuff, like making something that's a quality piece that's going to last forever. And if it's not going to last forever, what are my solutions as a brand to offer to you to help you make it last forever, right? Like, do I have a repair program or do I have a return program that allows me to help you recycle those goods or that allows me to help you figure out how to do something sustainable with it. And I think that's another really cool way that some brands are coming out and, and battling what's going on. And I think, you know, going back to my point of like trying to share knowledge across the industry, um, you know, one of the ways obviously like you can make a full polyester based um, garment that 100% polyester fabric that's, you know, uh, mechanical stretch. They have recyclable polyester zippers and um, adhesive tapes, like everything basically. And you could basically fully recycle that product at the end of life. Now, there's companies that have done this that are like single, um, single fiber products. But I haven't found how to recycle that once I'm done with it. Yeah. No one's telling yeah. me how to do that. It, I've, I've looked and I may be really bad at Google, but um, <laughs> I, I still don't know how. So it's a great concept, but like we're as a consumer, what do I do at the end? And if someone's again yeah. figured that out, like let's get it out there. Yeah, let's share it and let's all figure out how to actually do that and that last step, right? Yeah, I think that that goes hand in hand with some compostable fabrics too that I've been seeing out in the world. You know, there are some um, really cool mills, one that I've been working with, even you, you work with Tayana in, in Italy a little bit as well. And they've been talking about some compostable options. Um, and I kind of question that a little bit sometimes and question it with other brands who are saying the same thing and, and wonder mostly like, what does that mean for the spandex that's in it, right? Like there's, there's spandex that's usually included in a lot of these compostable polyesters or compostable fibers. So how are we, how are we making sure that all elements of that fabric both function because you need it to function in a performance piece, but also do what it, what you're saying it's going to do at the end of the day. Yeah. I, you know, I've dabbled in fabrics and sort of have spent some time doing that in my career. And okay. I, so Ben says he's <laughs> dabbled in fabrics. He's like the, the fabric expert that I go to when I ask me <laughs> questions about fabrics, but, but okay, you've dabbled. <laughs> there's, uh, again, there's, there's always people that are better than, you know, than you at something. So um, okay. <laughs> Anyway, I, I don't know the answer to that, I guess, is, is where I'm headed. Like, you know, a lot of what I rely on is obviously mills and, and there's good and bad from, from working with big mills and, you know, building those relationships across the industry is, is a huge part of it and sort of trusting what they're saying and, um, you know, asking the right questions, going to third parties, like there's so yeah. many different things to do and it's it's definitely hard to walk like the line of of what's actually marketing and what's something that's actually doing yeah. something yeah and i what i do like about it though is that we're seeing a shift in that in that direction right like people are trying and it might not be the full solution quite yet but at least we're taking baby steps to get there and we're talking about it and we're recognizing that it's important so even though, you know, those of us who are kind of in the know might have a lot of questions about it, there is at least, there's something to start looking toward. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to make you talk about fabrics because I think this is, even, I know, I know you hate it, but this is one of the things that I get questions for a lot. And I think you and I have had some interesting conversations around fabrics in the past too. Um, so there are some high-end mills out in the world. I'm mean, going to like Polar Tech is one of them. Um, Prima Loft is another. Um, I'm trying to think of, of some others that I can, that I could name. And, and what I get asked a lot by my clients is 
are those brands actually worth it to go and buy the fabrics from? And if so, why are more brands not doing that? Like, why don't we see Polar Tech in every freaking store on the entire planet? Because it's the best, right? According to Polar Tech, of course. But I think there's a little bit of a misconception on like, should we even be spending our money on this? And if not, why? And if so, why? Sure. So, and I think you could ask this question to a bunch of different people and get different answers. So I think that when you kind of like look back a little bit in the industry when like, you know, Polar Tech and Primo Loft were, were sort of like not new, but, you know, kind of like gaining their marketing traction. I think they they started to with something really unique and amazing. And I think today they still have a lot of that. Like Primo Loft and Polar Tech and Pertex and Gore-Tex, like all of these, they there is a reason that their products are great. And, you know, they've spent a lot of R&D money on new yarns and construction methods. Like if you look at um, some of the yarn shapes that like Pertex has been doing over the years, they've, you know, went from like a solid um, cylindrical shape to like a, a Y shape. So that way they start to stack and get more like downproof as they get washed and like all kinds of like really fine filaments. So that way they breathe better, like everything, you know, imaginable and like Polar, um, Primo, Polar Tech, there we go. Polar Tech is <laughs> one of the the huge brands that led a lot of the like recycled polyester um yeah they were one of the first i think probably i mean i could be a little wrong there but they were definitely early on in saying like almost all everything is recycled at this point yeah and Mm -hmm. you know their constructions are are really great their mill partners um you know are really good the challenge comes in at this point is you're you're prepaying for all of that. You know, when you're like going yeah. in and you're buying something from them, you're paying for that marketing budget, you're paying for for that name to be on your product. And that's a good thing in a lot of ways, right? You're, especially if you're a small brand or something, you're, you're trying to come in and you want to have something that gives you that kind of clout right away. And it's like, oh, we're using um, Polar Tech Alpha. Great. I know what that is as a consumer. I'm coming in, I see it. Oh, they must be working with, you know, a really good, good mill at this point, these fabrics are great. Mm-hmm. And, and I do think they're, they are great. The I, I, I agree. And I'm not oh, trying no, to I... say anything bad about any of these mills. I've, I've worked with a lot of these mills personally, and I would recommend them if you can afford them. Right. And, and so where the challenge comes in, especially for someone who's small and maybe doesn't have a rela- relationship there is they're making a ton of product all the time. You know, the power grid fleece is flying out the door from from the mills and it's going to these big brands that are ordering 20,000 plus meters a season. And if you're coming in as a little brand and you're ordering a single die lot of 270 meters or whatever it is that they they make as their MOQ, you might get stepped on and say like, sorry, we got pushed back and I've, I've worked at places that were fairly decent size. We're ordering mm-hmm. decent quantities and we did get pushed out. And then what do you do with your product line that you had marketing built out for? Like you had this whole thing, all of a sudden you're out a t- two months, three months or whatever. So yeah. that's the biggest scare um, that kind of keeps people away a little bit. <laughs> I think that's fair. Like all of these, they are, they have a priority obviously to their, their top, customers to to fulfill their orders first and and it can make it hard to get in if you're a smaller brand i think that's super fair so i what i want you to kind of talk to a little bit about and i don't know how far you are into this or whether you're open to sharing but um you've talked a little bit before about kelpie and and what that could turn into for you and some ideas that you've had with like really unique pattern making around kelpie that um, i'd love for you to just kind of give us a little bit of a sneak preview if, if you're open to that. Sure. So Kelpie has always been sort of this uh, ongoing joke with, with my wife and I. Um, <laughs> we're obviously surfers living in Santa Cruz and um, we're less than a mile from the beach. As you can see, the surfboards next to me, it gets extremely 
kelpy here. Um, the kelp forests are pretty dense. Unfortunately, they're dying off a little bit with, with everything that's happening um, in the environment. And there's people that are doing their best to kind of rejuvenate it. That's kind of a lot of, you know, organisms live in the kelp forest. And in the summer, particularly, the kelp grows pretty crazy and it gets in the way of surfing, sort of. So we kind of made this joke like, oh, it's really kelpy out. Like you got kelp, <laughs> like all these kind of like <laughs> jokes. So we, we've made this sort of brand that's, that's called Kelpie. And, um, you know, the logo is a drawing that my wife did in a minute of a narwhal with a uh, piece of kelp hanging from its, um, it's actually a, a tooth and not a horn believe it or not. Okay. And uh, so for, for a long time, we didn't really know what it was. We have some stickers and whatever, but lately I've been sort of playing around with the idea of, I, I use it for all of my branding on my website. So you'll see anything that's got like 3D renders on our website is all Kelpie branded. Um, we have little care content labels on there that say like, be kind, hang dry. And, and uh, so it, it's given like me, like sort of a source of of um, creativity to, to put towards. And yeah. to me, like the concept of Kelpie, if, if it ever fully comes to fruition as an apparel brand, is to kind of flip the whole model on its head of how I personally think an apparel business should be run. And yeah. it's like a completely different experience. It's bringing the consumer along at the very beginning, making sure that it's been built specifically for them on how like they feel connected to this. So my concept of apparel is right now, most people are consumers. Um, that's how we define them. What is our customer? What's our consumer? And I want people to start to change their mindset around instead of a consumer, they're basically like purveyors or like, um, they're owners of this kind of product. Like they're, they're mm -hmm. taking it and like cherishing it through like yeah. its life as long as they can. And I think the only way to have that is to have like this personal connection with it that you can't That's get cool. when you go into a store and just like pull this like tank top off the wall and say like, Oh, I love it. And everybody has like a few pieces in their, their closet that they're like really attached to, whether it's a t-shirt that you've had forever or a pair of sweatpants or what, like anything, whatever it is, or a pair of pants that you found that fit really, really well, you'll wear them yeah. until they're dead. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you'll desperately try to find a way to patch it or like you'll take it from an outside pant to an inside pant to give it an <laughs> extra life. And, and I think there's something really special about that. And so for me, like the idea of Kelpie is to, at the very beginning, someone kind of goes onto the website, everything's been built out in 3D and it's this like kind of collection of product that is sort of like refined into what we feel like makes sense for the brand as like a surfing brand. Um, it's all built around longevity and sort of like this timeless statement and all mm -hmm. the colors are staple colors. So there's nothing that's really um, like fashion. So there's no seasonality behind it. Um, that obviously that. causes a huge issue when you're trying to order a thousand meters of a coral that's going to only be in spring 22 and then is going to go out of style. What do you do with that? And then exactly. it ends up at like, we, we have a, a friend that has a factory over in um, San Jose and she thankfully saved a lot of fabrics from a lot of different mills and factories that closed mm -hmm. down and all of that stuff is dead stock that's sitting there that happens everywhere yeah. and so there's kind of two options that you could go down either creating stuff that's you know staple colors or using dead stock and kind of filling in product where you can and then once it's gone it's gone and like everything that. being basically made to order when someone comes online they say i i love this hoodie it's amazing i want to order one and they know that it's not ready right now so yeah. they basically are then taking on this like journey of building this product for themselves where cool. they, they order it. Someone reaches out to them and says, Hey, like, thanks for ordering this. Can you give us like a quick picture of yourself? Like maybe front and side or something, 
let's get our team sort of building a little quick avatar of what you look like um, just to make sure that we're kind of like aligned on what that is. Quickly throw it into some software. We've got the patterns already made up. Let's put you into a couple different sizes in 3D. We'll send them back to you and you can decide which one you like. That's cool. People aren't sure what they want exactly. Like I was in REI the other day with, with my wife and she was looking at some new Patagonia like um, fleeces and there was a bunch of different ones that she wanted and we're throwing on the different ones over the shirt you know just in the middle of the thing it's like oh <laughs> how's the extra large look screw it put it on and that was the only size they had of that one oh it's comfy it's really big I kind of like it what do I look? okay <laughs> let's 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 go to a medium on this one. Oh, the medium looks good sometimes I buy a large yeah. was you know and like and you get to have that whole experience right there with somebody who's kind of like attentive to you and, and trying to like guide you through this that's cool. Once you kind of figure out what size you want and the style you want, you can kind of potentially choose what fabric of dead stock that makes sense for that style that, that we've already built out or one of like the stock staple colors and, and a, you know, a fabric that's basically going to last forever. I love that. Everything's sort of built around an idea of sustainability and durability for longevity. Mm -hmm. And everything comes with instructions on how to be done with it at the end of its life. Because like I said at the beginning, I don't know what to do with my clothes after I'm done with them. And I work in the industry. So like, what yeah. am I supposed to do with these? Like they're, they're yeah. dead. I, I, I have a sewing machine and I um, have done prototype sewing. And I like, once I've gone through as much patching as I can, it's kind of like, yeah. Um, well, there are some things that, I mean, not to like go off an edge here, but like undergarments, like, when you've worn undergarments for, you know, a couple of years or however long they last until they start to go threadbare, like, what do you do with those? Like, traditionally, they've probably gone in the garbage. And I've been trying to do some research, too. Like, there are a couple of companies out there. Um, there's that company called Four Days. I don't know if you've heard of that one. But they'll, like, send you a bag and it's kind of like two parts. Like you can put anything in the bag and if they can resell it, they'll help you resell it or they'll recycle it for you. Well, I'm trying to understand like, how is this the only company that understands how to properly recycle stuff? And, and I think there's a lot of questioning of like how legitimate it is, but, but there is, there's, there's a huge question of like, I, I feel terrible throwing my clothes in the garbage, even if it's a pair of underpants, like, <laughs> It just needs to, it, it needs to go somewhere else so that it can be spun into either new yarns or, you know, I don't know what else we can do with it. There's, I've seen even places where they're making like park benches out of compressed recycled fabrics. That's cool. And there are some cool things that we could do with this stuff if we can just figure out where it's supposed to go. Yeah. My, my ultimate goal with like, other than just kind of like getting people a little bit more attached and not like building something like if, if Kelpie ever kind of like fully went through is keeping it really small and sort of like more yeah. just like bespoke basically. Yeah. And then I, I hope someday and, and I hope to be part of it. Someone sort of like has this full revamp of fully natural fiber products for performance wear. Um, mm -hmm. I have this conversation with every mill that I meet with and they always look at me like I'm crazy. Um, but I'm waiting for someone to build a fabric for me. That's like a hundred percent or a hundred percent natural fiber for surfing. Like, yeah, people used to ride in board shorts that were, you know, wool, cotton, like all these different things. And it was before we had spandex and, those lasted longer because that fiber breaks down like spandex breaks down much faster than everything else and at the end of cotton once you're done with it like it's it's fine to go back like just let it go back to, to the environment yeah. and yeah. and like using dye processes that are just natural like to build a full performance wear that's kind of like classic but with new technologies as far as knitting and weaving technologies I think there's so much you could do there with mechanical stretch to get the performance that you need out of it and kind yeah. of reach a new people without saying like, Hey, it's the same board chart that everyone else has made. 
Uh, yeah, no, it's fully, yeah, it's fully made from natural fibers and yeah, I've, I tend to find that a lot of those natural fibers are also a lot softer and, um, more pleasing to wear anyway. So yeah. Okay. Well, we'll look for that in the future and hopefully someday Kelpie comes to life. And, and if you aren't following Ben on Instagram, you can follow him at, is it Retopo? Yeah. It's Retopo Dev. Retopo Dev. And I know Kelpie is on there too, right? Yeah. Kelpie's sort of this like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's its own weird little thing. It's um, mostly just, you know, surf lifestyle kind of stuff, but cool. Um, well, yeah, we'll go follow Kelpie as well. And if that ever turns into an apparel line, you'll already be in on the know and, and you'll be part of it. So thank you so much, Ben. Um, this was a pleasure. I'll probably have you back because I could probably throw a zillion different questions and topics at you and we could just talk all day, but thanks for, for being on the podcast and, and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks so much. This has been a blast. Thank you so much for listening to the Business of Apparel podcast. I would so appreciate hearing your thoughts on the show. And if you know someone who could benefit from it, please share it with them. My biggest desire is to help other apparel professionals understand the nuances of our industry so we can all work toward making better product for a better world. If you would like to connect further, I'd love to invite you to send me a message through my website, unmarkstreet.com where I do weekly trainings through my video channel, a monthly newsletter, and offer so many resources to help you start and scale a profitable apparel brand.